Higher education is now in order and a quorum is present. Uh, the first bill that we will hear today is Senate File 636. Senator Fate, uh, to your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to move SF 636. Senator Fate moves Senate File 636. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep it short so I can turn it over to the testifiers. Uh, this is a really simple bill. Um, it establishes an ongoing appropriation of $1 million annually for each of the Minnesota's sovereign tribal colleges. Um, Red Lake Nation College, Leech Lake Tribal College, and the White Earth Community and Tribal College. I would, wa I would want to thank and recognize Senator Rarick for his leadership uh, as the chief author of this bill last session and Senators Duckworth and Kunish for signing on as co-authors. Uh, members, you may recall that both the House and the Senate included this bill in their omnibus, and tribal college funding was a part of the final conference agreement. Um, this bill has broad bipartisan support, and it's time to get this done. Uh, I'm happy to welcome the presidents of the three tribal colleges back to our committee, and I'll let them tell you more about what this funding would mean to them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fateh. Our first testifier is uh, uh, virtual, uh, and that is uh, Ms. Anna Shepard. Ms. Shepard, if you would please uh, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, and commence your test, uh, state your name for the record, full name for the record, and commence your testimony when, when you are ready. Ms. Shepard, can you hear us? Uh, let's move to our uh, first in-person testifier, please. Uh, Chief Dan King, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, all right, Ms. Shepard, if you would please, uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony. Yes, my name is Anna Shepard. I'm with White Earth Tribal Community College. I'm the president here. And I just want to say thank you, Chairman and members of the Senate Committee for the invite to discuss Senate File 636 today. Would you like me to continue? Yes, please, Ms. Shepard. Commence your testimony. Okay. okay. Um, tribal colleges serve a unique and important role in providing higher education and training to Indigenous students who often have been historically excluded from traditional educational institutions. The United States government in the 19th and early 20th century created policies aimed to assimilate indigenous individuals into mainstream American culture, which were designed to erase indigenous cultures and traditions from student lives. TCUs, otherwise known as tribal colleges and universities, emerged in the late 1960s to provide culturally, cultural relevant and responsive education that incorporates indigenous knowledge, language, and ways of knowing. They often offer smaller classes, individualized attention, and wraparound support services to help indigenous students succeed academically and personally. Tribal colleges have become an important part of the educational landscape for indigenous people, providing an opportunity for indigenous students to earn a higher education while maintaining connection to their culture and community. As a current student shared with me, they chose to attend a TCU because they felt comfortable at our college. They felt a sense of belonging. They liked the smaller class sizes and the low teacher to student ratio. Funding TCUs are important investment in our indigenous communities for all students who would like to attend the college. We're asking for your support in approving Senate File 636 bill. This will fund Minnesota public higher education schools to provide funding for operations and maintenance to support Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you, President Shepard. Our next testifier is in person. It's uh, Chief King. If you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Bonjour and hello everyone. My name is Dan King and I'm president of the Red Lake Nation College and also very honored to be one of the hereditary chiefs from the Red Lake Nation. I'll be providing an overall summary for all three tribal colleges who we worked on this together on this presentation. And this is Bill supporting uh, Senate file 636 
and House File 750. And as was mentioned already, I just wanted to thank uh, Senator Fate and the Vice Chair and all the committee members for hearing us again. Uh, this is a crucial funding request and I will be sharing with you about a six to seven minute summary and then turning it over to the Leech Lake Tribal College President who is uh, to my left. And as we mentioned, uh, that we are really transforming communities here. Um, we are really two-year community colleges that serve a unique market niche that nobody else is serving, and that is natives on res reservations or in urban off-reservation communities. And I always like to say we're in the people business. We build people up. We build up their academic skills, their confidence, so that after that two years, they can move on to the next level. And that's really our goal, not to get them two-year degrees, but to get four-year masters and so on, and then come back and help their reservation communities. As I think I mentioned before, we are open to the public, so anyone can attend. About 15 to 20% of our students are non-native. And we really partner with <clears throat> everyone anywhere. Uh, since we are online, we started that during COVID and we kept it up because we found our retention rates and our attendance, our graduation, everything is improving. We, we are what, what is known as an open enrollment college. So all you really need is a high school diploma or a GED to come to our schools. And we target low income natives. That's kind of our primary, primary market. We do serve the three tribal colleges today represent about 70% of the natives in Minnesota. So that's about 48,000 of the 70,000 natives are represented, by, are represented by our three colleges. And typically in Indian communities, we have large undercounts in US censuses. So you'll see the numbers kind of vary uh, from what the tribe state and from what the actual record is. Our recipe for success after 30 years of doing this for the Minnesota tribal colleges we kind of have it down about what it takes to get Native Americans through college. And our secret sauce really is this. Small class sizes, average of about 10, personalized one-on-one -on -one attention with family connections with the students. We're really known as family colleges. And the education we provide is from a Native perspective that a lot of times our students, even Native students, are learning for the first time the history from the native perspective. And we infuse the seven Ojibwe values, we're all Ojibwe tribes, all three of us, and pride in who they are as individuals, and also the culture and language is infused in our education. We provide a lot of mentorship since uh, about 80% of our students are first generation college students, meaning they're the first ones in their families to go to college and 70% of our faculty and staff are natives. So just the mentoring aspects of that and how a lot of the students, sometimes they're seeing a native person as their instructor for the first time in their lives. So this support system, the counseling, we offer emergency funds, food shelves, just the overall support system for the students. That's kind of our recipe. And here's the proof that our recipe is working is if you look at persistence rates, and these are all from the last couple years, the US national two-year average is about 75%. The Minnesota two-year average was about 69, just below that. And Red Lake Nation College, our most recent number, 85%. So we're doing it right and we're keeping students in school. Retention rate, the fall to fall rate, the two-year uh, rate was about 61%. We weren't able to find a Minnesota comparable number, and our Red Lake Nation College percentage is about 56%. So we, we kind of estimate the state number is, is anywhere from 56 to 61. So the point being that we're doing it as similar, as good as, or even better than the mainstream schools at getting Native students through college. And just for, uh, take a look at the high school grad rate, the national average about 88%. Minnesota state average, very close to that, one of the best in the country, about 87%. But for Minnesota natives, 35 to 58% high school graduation rates. So that's the education, we call it an education canyon, not an education gap. 
And so the 35% comes from Red Lake. So uh, that's the challenge is we oftentimes have to take a student coming in at a ninth or 10th grade level and take them up to junior in college, about six levels in two years. And they kind of call us unfunded miracles, the tribal colleges, that we're able to do so much with so little. But imagine the lost opportunities if we got fully funded. What could we do then? And so the thing I like to talk about as a former, I spent most of my career in business, is the ROI, the return on investment. And that's what I think could be a really impactful, probably the best $3 million that the legislature spends this year would be the $3 million that are put into our tribal colleges. As we all know, the gold standard of higher education is regional accreditation. And we have that at our three tribal colleges. We are all accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Uh, and so uh, we feel like that is a huge selling point. And it shows that our quality of standard of education, we're in the same arena as Notre Dame. So in other words, we have to meet the exact same accreditation standards as Notre Dame and these great universities in our region. So uh, the fact that we have that and that our credits transfer to the other schools. We follow the Minsky state system. We designed our schools like that so that the credits would easily transfer into the 11 areas of the Minsky system. And so we all have transfer agreements with all the schools. So they can transfer to Metro State, the U of M, or any of these other schools because we already have the agreements. Uh, the University of Minnesota has a uh, free tuition for all natives who are families incomes are under 75,000 a year. So our students have that as an excellent pathway. That's something new that was started. And some of our students, they will qualify for that. So this will help a lot of tribal college students. Here's some more student benefits. You know, most of our students are low income. So we emphasize grants. And since our they are low income, the tuition rates that we can charge are only 140 to 195 per credit. And most of our students graduate with zero debt after two years. And when you think the national average of four year degree in this country right now is about $33,000, the average debt in this country. So if our students get through those first two years, that's pretty amazing with zero debt. But they're probably going to have to take on some debt as they transfer to other schools. But we offer a lot of counseling, mentoring, one-on-one -on -one help. And that comes at a little bit of a higher cost since our average class size is about 10. And our students get laptops with free internet access for the duration of the time they're in school. And we put that as part of the fees so they don't have to pay for that up front. That's just part of the financial aid because most of our students wouldn't be able to afford that anyways. For Minneapolis, and we're just going on to, uh, we already started this campus in many, downtown Minneapolis. You could probably throw a rock from our building and hit US Bank Stadium. We're right across the street. So we're pretty proud of this. Uh, the tribe already invested $12 million. And so we're actually uh, looking to uh, raise another $3 million to finish that. We're, we're working on it this year. We have 8,000 tribal members uh, off the reservation, and there are over 50,000 natives in the Twin Cities. So we represent one of the largest urban centers of natives in the country, but there's no tribal college serving that market. And so we would be one of the first, not only in Minnesota, but in the country to be in a major urban setting. So I think Minnesota and the Twin Cities should be very proud of that fact uh, as we're opening this college. So if, if I only showed you one slide throughout uh, my time here, this is probably the one I would show you. And this shows the budget allocations for higher ed in 2021. Uh, the system you see at the top there, University of Minnesota, 684 million that year. And that's about 18% of their budget. The Minnesota state system, 353, that's 76% of their budget. And the three tribal colleges in Minnesota, zero. And as we mentioned, Red Lake, Leech Lake, and White Earth, that's 70% of the natives in Minnesota. So what that means is the only three public schools in Minnesota not receiving any direct aid for operations would be Red Lake, Leech Lake, and White Earth. 
So the results of this underfunding are really less staff and infrastructure than the mainstream schools. A lot of our jobs, I think we have like four or five jobs that have been unfilled for about a year. Most of our staff must do two to three jobs and we only pay about 70% of what the mainstream state schools pay. So it was difficult before the pandemic and now it's becoming an almost impossible task. Because we really serve the, the highest poverty, the high need communities like Beltrami County, where Red Lake is from up in, in Bemidji area that covers Red Lake and Leech Lake reservations. One of the poorest counties in the state and so with a tremendous lack of funding, that results in the greatest educational injustices. And that's why you see those tremendous education gaps. Here's a good example right here. A lot of what we're talking about is really economics. You know, and I come from a business background. So I looked at it and I said, well, geez, if the U of M tuition funds about 26% of their budget, because they can charge a higher tuition. And I know because my daughter goes there and we pay about 30, over $30,000 a year with everything all in. So uh, the, the tuition is higher at the U of M. The state school tuition, that funds about 10% of their budget. But at the tribal colleges, since we can only charge 140 to 190 a credit, that only funds about 3 to 5% of our budget. So you think about that. We're kind of taking two big hits because we don't get the state funding and we can't charge as much in tuition so what that means is our tribes, grants, federal funding, or donations is really what supports us. So if you take the state funding out of any of those systems, they wouldn't be able to survive. You can see what a big impact that is. So for the tribal colleges, we're missing a huge piece of the pie from lack of state funding and then the inability to charge tuition because of who we're serving. So those are big, huge, they're really economic issues. So that's why we, we come to you today and ask for your support on this bill. And like I said, I really think this would be the best $3 million you invest this year in your system by providing $1 million to each of the tribal colleges. So we, we re respectfully request your support on this and thank you for your time. Thank you, President King. Uh, members, do we have any questions? Uh, that was a fairly substantial presentation, so maybe we take a pause to ask questions. Senator Verbeaten, Senator Verbeaten. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, President. I just wanted to say, like, wow, what a great presentation. Um, thank you for calling that an education canyon, and thank you for your work. I was writing down what you were saying about um, small class sizes, one-on-one -on -one attention, family connection, culture and language. Like The rest of our state needs to be looking to you as a, a model for how to support our students, and the data really speaks for itself. So thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm really excited to see this bill and support it and make sure that you get the funding you need. Thank you, Senator. Members, any other questions? Our next testifier is uh, Ms. Montgomery. Uh, Ms. Montgomery, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Sure, my name is Dr. Helen Montgomery and I am the president at Leech Lake Tribal College. Um, I wanted to, um, President King has done a tremendous job, and, and I'm really the stats person here uh, out of the three of us. But, you know, I, I want to, President King has done a really excellent job just walking you through all the numbers. And I know I sent in my PowerPoint presentation to you. I have a Mac, so I can't connect to this. But I will walk you through and really zoom you into our student experience. Because really what I want to talk about this is the students. And you're going to hear from some of our students um, it, but, uh, but I really want to, I want to talk about our students. I want to talk about some of the barriers. I try my best and I promised myself that I would not come to a conversation about our students from a place of failure. I come to the conversations about our students from a place of overcoming barriers. And so our students, um, there are some visuals in my PowerPoint that are powerful and interesting um, describing the Leech Lake Nation and our state of, for example, being a food desert and how much of our population live 10 miles or more away from a food source like a supermarket or a store where they can purchase 
food. So about 70% of our students, and I think that we can really take these numbers across all three of our colleges. We sort of use them flexibly. Um, you know, we might have like a 5% margin of error there, but the numbers I'm, I'm quoting today are probably applicable to all three of our institutions. About 70% of our students struggle with transportation in general and getting to our college. 60% struggle with childcare. 50 over 50% struggle with mental health issues. Over 50% struggle with employment issues. Over 80% of our students have had severe uh, barriers to ac with access to food and housing, or one of those, or both. Um, almost half of our students have poor or no access to broadband internet. So they go and park in somebody's yard who has a Wi-Fi and do their homework. Um, and uh, now, now that we've been able to provide our students with computer equipment, we're down to about 30% of students who have a hard time, um, you know, uh, getting access to computer equipment and have to do their homework on the phone. Um, like our students, we have provided, we provide and have provided and continuously will provide aid to our students. Um, over the past year, we've awarded about $100,000 in aid uh, and student, direct student support to students. This support has been in the forms of like utilities help, um, housing or rental help, vehicle repairs. That's a really common one. Um, miscellaneous things like food cards, fuel cards, um, child care, medication, um, things like that, that that we just provide to our students on an as-needed basis. We also provide meals to our students at the college and other supports. Um, but recently, uh, we've been able to, and, and I want to, to talk, if President King has one slide, and I have one slide as well, um, I want to talk about uh, mental health. I want to talk about mental health because I know it's, it's a topic. It's a topic in, in higher ed. We know that our students are struggling, the COVID pandemic and student loan debt and all of the life factors and cognition just not moving as quickly as our... <coughs> machines move, you know, all of these factors are bringing us to a state of mental health that is concerning. But we have recently been able to hire a mental health provider in our college. And um, we, this is a licensed graduate social worker, and this individual gets paid $40,000 a year. Um, that, of course, is just about, maybe a little bit over. Um, that's all we can afford. Um, I don't know how long this person is going to stay, because they can make a lot more money somewhere else. Uh, but I want to talk about mental health because I want to read um, some of, so in your presentation, if you ever look at it, you'll see these in quotes. These aren't actual quotes from students. They're altered enough to conceal identities. But I want to talk about the mental health of our students at our college. So three out of five of students at our college come in and say, I need help either to a faculty member, our mental health provider, or myself. And when they're asked, why do you need help? They say things like, I don't know. I just feel horrible in my head. I am scared. They say, I don't have gas money to get to school, and I'm scared I will fail my classes. I don't want my teacher to think I'm lazy. I have straight A's and custody of four of my siblings. I don't have money to register my car, but I have to take them to school. Now, now Child Services wants to get involved. I don't want them to go to foster care. I have not eaten in four days, and I've been staying at the shelter. I was told I have PTSD because of some of my experiences in foster care, but they said I have to wait six months for a diagnostic assessment. And finally, we hear from a lot of students, the college is the only place I feel safe. So um, I want to continue to be able to support our students in this way. Um, and I want to give you some numbers um, of just costs of what it would take me as a person who employs staff, how much it would cost me to provide some of these supports. So it would cost me $52,000 a year to have a mental health provider who's already on staff. 
It would cost me $40,000 a year to provide a cultural connection support person who is also already on staff but is, can only be afforded part-time. Somebody dedicated to students to help them connect with their spirituality, culture, and help in ways other than Western-based or Eurocentric uh, medical healthcare model can. It would cost us about three hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars to develop a new program. We're looking to developing a new program in social work because we are uh, we, lots of our students want to go to social work into social work uh, to help, but also we are very good at being culturally sensitive. We are very good at being having the secret sauce model, right? And so we're able to also offer our neighboring institutions opportunities to have their students dual credit with us and learn about indigenous-based or indigenous-focused social work. Um, we badly need a professional education workforce development individual. We have lots of opportunities to partner with organizations who want to help. We just don't have anybody to coordinate those opportunities. and. As President King mentioned, most of us do five or six jobs. I am the president of a college, and I have never had a full cabinet because we cannot hire individuals up there. So I have been the human resources director. I have been the finance person. I have been, I have not been the dean of student services, but I've been the dean of academics. Uh, so we all do the things we need to do to make it happen. And we do make it happen, and we make it happen pretty well given our stats. So um, I wanted to, I, I'll be happy to answer any questions. The last time I was with you, I talked about the inequality in pay. I talked about the fact that my employees haven't had a reliable COLA for a decade. Uh, there have been COLA increases a few times in our history, but not, not reliably. Um, so I want to, what I want, what I would like, what I would love, uh, for this funding to do for my people at the college is just to provide some stability. So that 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 finishes my presentation. So if you have questions, uh, please, I'm open to them. Thank you, President Montgomery. Uh, members, questions, comments for President Montgomery? Thank you very much for your, your testimony. Um, our next testifier is Mr. Tibbetts, who I believe is online. Mr. Tibbetts, if you could please unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Um, my name is Emma Tibbetts. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the Senate Higher Education Committee. Um, today, I just want to speak about community college, specifically tribal community colleges, and how it has benefited my life greatly. Um, I'm currently the Student Senate President here at the college. I'm also the TC representative um, in the state of Minnesota, the Office of Higher Education. So I represent the tribal college and universities. And, um, Mr. Tippett, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Could you speak just a little bit louder or closer to your yeah, microphone? I, I apologize. No, no, that's it's. Um, thank you for accommodating us. I appreciate it. And again, I'm sorry for interrupting you, man. No. Um, yeah, so I am president of the Student Senate, TC representative for the Student Advisory Council for the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, representing the um, other tribal college universities for the state of Minnesota. And I just want to talk about why I chose Whitehart Tribal Community College. I went through a lot of hardships in my life. Um, there's this idea that you need to move away from home to seek a higher education and get the full college experience. Um, I tried to do that. I also suffered the loss of my parents during this time. So for me, I needed a sense of stability. And when I came back home, recouped, spent time with family, and that's when I got introduced to the um, Whiter Chapel Community College. I didn't know much about it, and there's this stigma about travel colleges that they left them, just like community colleges anywhere. Um, so for me, it was a different step to take on um, coming here, but I will be forever grateful for that. Um, it's a huge stepping stone for more opportunities. I have acquired so much skills and knowledge, and just like this opportunity I have right now to speak to you, I'm very grateful for it. Um, this is like a second home to a lot of other students and members of the community, for myself included. Um, I think anytime I tell people that, they say, what do you do in your downtime? Anytime I have time off, or something to do, I'm here at the college. 
you know, speaking to students, mentoring students, um, reaching out, seeing what people need. Um, and for me, this is a stepping stone to get my higher education in psychology, like um, President Montgomery spoke about um, the need of mental health um, within our communities, within our schools, especially me dealing with the loss of my parents and dealing with a few um, mental disorders, PTSD and other stuff like that from the loss of my parents and just the lives we all live on the reservations. This will, this was my stepping stone to go to a university, major in psychology, minor in Native American studies, so I can come back and help the youth and our people the way I needed to be helped during that time. Um, you see these Western services being held, are held and offered, but when you seek mental health services here on the um, reservations, you do not see ceremonies, you do not see traditional teachings or language, um, smudging, like just our traditional everything is not offered as widely as it should be, as I think especially for locations that are on reservations and supporting reservation youth. So for me, that's my drive to get my higher education in this field because um, just the outright need for mental health providers, especially in our communities, is just is something that's really needed. I spoke to a licensed psychologist here on the White Earth Reservation and she said she holds on average seven to eight people a day. And it can take up to three to five months to even get in to see somebody for um, mental health services, just to even talk, just to even tell someone that what their problem is. And if you look at the rates of suicide among the Native American communities, I think this is a problem that needs to be tackled immediately um, rather than later. So everything I've done up until this moment, all the opportunities I've had, especially this opportunity, um, I give thanks to the White Tribal Community College. It will hold a special place in my heart for the rest of my life. And I hope that one day maybe I can work here, offer mental health services. But that concludes my speech. And I want to thank you all again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak. And I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tibbetts, for your, your testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, our next testifier is a person. Uh, it's Mr. Maingan. Yep. If you would please, <laughs> thanks, I'm working on it, man. Thanks for that. If you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. All right, Buju, uh, Ricardo Maingan, Indigenous Cause. Ricardo Maingan is my name. I'm here today to represent Red Lake Nation College's Minneapolis site down down here in the cities, and um, yeah, I'm currently studying social and behavioral sciences as part of our associate's degree, and um, our tribal college, man, has just been the best decision of my life. I, the opportunities that I've been given is just, I never would have imagined it. I've had the opportunity to learn about my culture and learn about my language and learn about where we come from as a people. You know, growing up in the cities, I haven't had the opportunity to even visit my reservation yet, but I'm going up there next week, so I'm looking forward to that. And um, it's just so eye-opening, you know. And throughout high school and middle school, I've only been taught that in history books, we were savage Indians, basically, and Christopher Columbus saved us. And uh, that couldn't have been farther from the truth. And learning about who we are, I get a walk taller now. I feel so much more proud, and I just feel like I can accomplish anything. And previously, after high school, I took a gap year. So I graduated in probably the best year to graduate, 2020, you know, at the height of the pandemic. Um, that was a time to be alive. but. So I decided to take a gap year, and I went to Century College after. And, um, you know, me being a 19-year-old student, I thought I knew everything. And what I was getting there was uh, lectures or, like, being taught in the form of pre-recorded lectures. And we would have to email our teachers to get a hold of them. And the fastest response time was, like, two days or more. And we'd have assignment due in two days, you know. And... I just thought I knew everything. And I was like, man, college is not for me. College is horrible. Like, who needs an education? And after that year passed, I encountered a lot of students from the University of Minnesota in our dance community. And I just felt like I was really missing out on something. So the last day of enrollment last, or this last summer, yep, I went down to our tribal college in the cities, our Minneapolis site. and. 
I was just like, yeah, I'm just interested. And they're like, well, today's the last day to enroll, so you better sign up. And I was like, all right. And just walking into our site was so empowering, you know, seeing what our tribe has done and the first urban campus. And, you know, I always thought I was too good for a tribal college just because of what I was taught about our people, that we were uneducated, that we uh, didn't have any beliefs, any religion. And all of that is so untrue. And, um, you know, the people I go to school with are a lot of elders in our community. A lot of my instructors are elders and they're every day they teach me what it is to be a leader. You know, growing up playing basketball all the way through from middle school, elementary school to high school, everyone had sold me like coaches are like, oh, you would make a great leader. Like, oh, you know, playing point guard, that's like the thing. But I never was shown what it's like to be a leader growing up with a single mom. Every day I go to college, <clears throat> People like Dan King, people like Devery Fairbanks, um, Nadine. You know, we have so many people that show me what it looks like to be a leader and what it looks like to care for our people and empower me every day and tell me you can do great things. You know, you're not bound to stay in Minneapolis. You can go and start movements. You can go and teach the kids. And if you look at stories like Emmett, Emmett's a huge inspiration to me. And I just met him last week in Washington, D.C. But the students I go to class with every day, aren't going to school to aspire to make a living. Our students go to school aspiring to make change. And that's the thing that we need in our Native American communities. And um, you know, you look at our students, they wanna be educators. They wanna teach the youth today about things that they didn't know about our language and about our culture and give them that head start that we didn't get until we're 19, 20 plus years old in college. So. Um, you have Emmett, like, who wants to be a psychologist. And if you, you know, to realize who we are as a people, you have to realize what we once were. And we were free, you know. We didn't have, we weren't bound to reservations. We had so much open land and we had religion and spirituality. And, um, you know, if you were able to go to a reservation, which some of you may have been, it's a lot of depression, uh, alcohol abuse, drug addiction, suicide rates are high, um, a lot of crime, but there's also the beautiful side of it. And for a lot of people on the reservations, tribal colleges is that safe haven, is that place where you can go and know that you're safe and know that there are people around you who care about you every day. And uh, yeah, I, I could go on forever about how great of a decision it's been enrolling in tribal colleges and learning about who I am and, but, that's basically that, so please, I'm open to any questions, you know. I really want you guys to understand how important this is to us and just how much of a life changer it's been. So thank you guys. Thank you, Mr. Magan, for your, your testimony and for your leadership. And I, for one, wouldn't mind if you went on forever because you're a lot more interesting than the rest <laughs> of us can be sometimes. Uh, and your story is edifying and inspirational, and we're all better for hearing it. So thank you for thank being you so here. Thank you so much. Uh, members, questions uh, for any of our testifiers or the bill's author? Senator Kupek. Yeah, no, I don't really have a question, but I remember 20 years ago, uh, I, went to, I went to the White Earth Tribal Community College to pay a visit to the campus, and at that time, it was in a couple of old, kind of dilapidated, rundown storefronts on straight, uh, Main Street in Manoman. And so it's, you know, uh, being in Moorhead and, and watching from the side, how this college has grown, and then and to see those students, uh, you know, arrive. Some of them have come, you know, to, to Minnesota State University Moorhead, and to see that that kind of feeder pipeline, and to see that all you have done, really, without the benefit of any resources from us, Mr. Chair. So, uh, if we give this money, it's all, I'm really excited to see where you can take this to the next level. So, I'm re really happy to support this, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm always reminded in this room that I am not the tallest person in the space. <laughs> um, I am um, really grateful for this presentation uh, and for the bill, uh, Senator Fate, and for its value for all of us. Um, I, I did want to speak specifically to Ricardo. Um, I am not as young as you are. Um, really? <laughs> really? Um, we'll have Look to see who's that. taller. But we already know who's younger. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and you are speaking, uh, I think, two important things you are sharing with us, the hardships that you have experienced and seen. Um, and that's real in life. Um, but you're also talking about the wonder you see around you. You're using different language than that. But when you talk about what's possible, your eyes are lighting up. Um, and it is that wonder <coughs> every day, what a time to be alive, that carries us through all of the hardship that we'll face. And I hope that you are able to share that with those around you. It's infectious. Uh, I, I needed a little bit of that today, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, but knowing you know, that life is good and long and hard, um, I just want you to hear from one uh, wondering person to another um, that that will carry you through every hardship that you face. And I am grateful that you're here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Members, any other discussion? Chairman, could, could I add one final comment? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. President King. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say th thank you for everybody for listening to us and hearing us out. Uh, I just wanted to close by mentioning that our, our Minneapolis campus that RJ here is from, and you see how inspiring he is. And we have many students with similar type stories and the obstacles and, and challenges that they overcame just to really go to school. Uh, a lot of our students, their uh, the average age is a 29-year-old female with children. That's our average type student. But we're getting more and more students like RJ right out of high school, uh, really sharp students that they have all this potential, they just need the opportunity. And that's why we expanded our tribal college model that has been so successful up north in the rural areas. We're bringing that to the Twin Cities. And we'll be, like I said, this will be something I think Minnesota can brag about, that we'll be one of the first locations of a tribal college in a major urban setting in the country. And so right downtown Minneapolis, and I invite all of you to stop by whenever you have time to come and check us out. We're in construction right now. And it's a $15 million facility. The tribe and the college invested $12 million. And that should have been enough, but with inflation kind of going up, uh, everything, just like everything in the world, right, the price has gone up. So we're $3 million short. We already started, and we're going to finish in December. So we put a $3 million bonding bill together. And I want to say a huge thank you to Senator Fate, Senator Rarick, Senator Pappas, who are supporting, and we just got the number today, uh, 1700, SF 1700. So I hope that all of you can support that bill. And we have bipartisan support in the House and the Senate. And so there's a House bill that's coming through, and we haven't got the number yet. But I'm hoping you can support that, because I'm telling you, that will be the second best $3 million you spend <laughs> after this. But uh, that will make a huge impact for students like RJ, who can finish their education, and transfer to places like the University of Minnesota or Augsburg, or like a recent student who finished our two-year school, started as a high school student, and then transferred to Dartmouth and graduated, and then wrote a book after that. So these are the kinds of things our students can compete anywhere if given the educational opportunity. So if I'm hoping all of you can support this bill and then the Red Lake Nation College $3 million bonding bill, SF 1700. So thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you, President King. Chair uh, Fate, any, uh, well, two things. One, I just heard an invitation for a field trip for yes. the <laughs> committee. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and two, do you have any final closing comments on your bill? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, you heard from uh, the presidents, they spoke to it better than I could, what this appropriation would mean uh, to them and their colleges and their students. Um, and the work that they are doing. And you heard from a student, RJ, who gave a powerful testimony um, about how uh, this program and this college has changed his life and um, what it means to him. Um, I think he said something along the lines of, uh, he's not looking to make a living, but make change, right? Um, and these, these kids are our future. They're gonna be our future teachers, doctors, psychologists. They'll be in your chair one day. Um, so um, I'm proud to support this, and uh, I hope to get uh, the full committee support. So thank you. 
Senator Vitae uh, renews his, move, his motion uh, that uh, Senate File 636 be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Senate File 636 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Next up, we got uh, SF 1213, Senator Umu Verbitten. Um, I understand that you have uh, A1 author's amendment. Would you like to tell us about the amendment and make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. The author's amendment just uh, narrows the scope to the original intent of the bill. It makes the language of the statute clearer. We're uh, repealing the exclusionary language and replaced it with inclusionary language, so it's just more easily understood. And I'd like to move the A1 amendment. Thank you. Um, Senator Umu Verbein moves that the A1 amendment be adopted. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion is adopted. Um, today we have with us also is going to be uh, President Jenna Chernega. Um, so I think Senator Omar Bain, are you first? Yes. Um, to, okay, so please proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Senate Bill 1213 um, really is addressing an issue of uh, lack of representation. So under our current statute, faculty teaching classes outside of the traditional fall or spring semester do not qualify for union representation, and this bill fixes that. Uh, adjunct faculty will be the largest group impacted, and as contingent employees, they often have the least protection or benefits. So this provides those affected faculty with the ability to enjoy the same benefits and protections as faculty teaching in the fall and spring semesters. They will qualify for all the benefits and protections um, as those faculty teaching in summer and fall, and that's guaranteed minimum pay, tuition waivers, paid leave, um, access to professional development resources and more. And so the ultimate goal of this bill is to maintain the minimum threshold for union representation of more than three credits or two or more classes. And the change is expanding that threshold from uh, the more traditional academic year to the modern reality of year-round higher educational opportunities. And I'd uh, love to pass it to President Trenega to um, provide some more details. President Trenega. Thank you so much, Chair Fate, Vice Chair Putnam, members of the, uh, the committee, um, and thank you, uh, Senator Omoverbaten, for authoring this bill. I'd also like to uh, thank Senate Council for getting our amendment drafted so quickly. Um, before I start, I would like to just briefly mention, given the previous bill that was considered, that the IFO is um, very much in favor of supporting the tribal colleges, and we do hope that uh, you will um, support them generously with their, with their request. So, um, My name is Jennifer Chernega. I'm the president of the Interfaculty Organization, or the IFO. And we currently represent the teaching faculty, coaches, counselors, and librarians who work during the academic year. Um, this bill, as uh, Senator Omovert Payton mentioned, um, is to bring into alignment our colleagues who may only teach during the summer or other sessions that are outside of the current academic year. 
Um, our faculty can teach up to 16 credits in the summer. A normal full-time load is 24, and so we have some faculty across the system who are teaching an almost two-thirds of a full-time load in the summer who are not being protected by any union contract um, or receiving the benefit of being in a bargaining unit. Pelro was drafted during a time when summer sessions were not common, but now they make up a significant portion of most students' uh, college experience, and we would like to represent those faculty who teach and work only in the summer. As we mentioned, there are currently faculty who are not receiving the full benefits and protections of our contract just because they teach during road construction season. None of the faculty, of course, would be required to join the union, um, as none of our faculty currently are required to join the union, uh, but we would provide protections and represent them uh, in, in their best interests as part of this bill. Um, I would ask for your support of this bill um, in expanding coverage to our employees who teach just during the summer. Thank you, President Chenega. Are there any questions from our committee members? Seeing none, uh, Senator Umu Verbein, would you like to uh, move uh, your bill? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I move that uh, Senate File 1213 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Labor Committee. Uh, State Gov. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I move that Senate File 1213 be recommended to pass and be referred to the uh, State and Local Government Committee. As amended. As amended, yes, awesome. thank you. No Senator Umu Verbein moves that Senate File 1213 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The bill is recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. And with no further business, we are now adjourned. Thank you.